Hello. It's good to see you. Today, we are going to take a look through this Mechanics Illustrated. This is from August 1940. Yeah, August 1940. It was 10 cents. And it makes me feel better to know that it's guaranteed. Satisfaction guaranteed or double your money back. You could get 20 cents back if you're not happy. See page 64. Well, I'm pretty happy with it. I don't reckon I'll ask for 20 cents. We've looked at this before. We've read some stuff in this little, little magazine. I thought we would just look through here and find some stuff to read. In the front, they have these little classified ads. Patents for sale. What? Oh, Outrider to royalty patents. Somebody is selling patents to unique auto license holders to improved typewriter eraser embracing patents. Also, duck decoying outfit. A patent for that, and a water and feed device for bird cages, and a cigarette case and dispenser patent, and a paddle game. We have a design patent of a bunny hop, a toy rabbit design, and a trademark on the name Bunny Hop. And there's the trademark number. All these patents expired long ago. It's just cool. I've never. I've never seen that. That's pretty neat. And baseball for the blind. The latest thing in air-cooled cars. That definitely looks cool. Vacuum bonnet cleans the face. <laughs> what? Okay. Let's we got to we got to read these. These sound interesting. Okay, baseball for the blind. Now this probably was not a good video for me to make tonight. I'll be honest with you. I'm, I actually had, I had an eye exam earlier this, this afternoon, <laughs> and my pupils are still a little bit dilated and everything looks a little blurry, but I want to do the best I can, because this is what I wanted to do today. I wanted to look through here tonight with these, with you, for, with this little magazine, but I may have to get a little closer to it to read it. <laughs> Whenever I get my pupils dilated, they stay that way for hours. It's so annoying. I do have to get a new prescription. I did find out my vision has gotten slightly worse. <laughs> but other than that, my eyes are fine. I'm just, the doctor said, it's okay, you're just getting older. It's nothing weird. Okay. So here we have an article about baseball for the blind. And above we have a blind pitcher winding up for a fast one. Over here on the right, strike one, a blind batter swings wide. That would be terrifying. I'd be scared to play baseball. <laughs> Just baseballs are hard, you know. I'd be terrified. Well, let's read this little piece here. One of the most popular sports is now made available to the blind. A remarkably ingenious system of cables permits the sightless players to play the game with practically the same basic rules as are generally followed. The ball is replaced by a ring, which is quote-unquote pitched along a cable with a stick by the man on the mound. The catcher stops the ring with a sliding block on the cable and then returns it to the pitcher with a shove. I'm confused. The hitting ability or batting average of a blind player is largely determined by the accuracy with which he can gauge the position of the sliding ring by, by its sound. The pitcher must, of course, use the same method to stop the ring. In running the bases, the players follow a cable. A sliding leather strap guides them along the baseline. One, two, or three bases may be used. When there are more than one, the runner must change straps. A great aid to health and morale, this game may soon be adapted by many blind institutions throughout the country. Oh, so here we have a, a player running. When the fans yell slide, they really mean it. A blind base runner runs the slider. Well, that's pretty cool. Okay, so I see what it is up here now. It's kind of hard to see, but there's a little ring right here. 
Okay, so he slides it along a cable. That's, huh, that's interesting. Okay, now the next article we have is the latest thing in air-cooled cars. Looks like a little go-kart. This odd-looking contraption, dubbed an auto cycle, was recently built by T. James Stinson of Cleveland, Ohio. Powered with a motorcycle engine, it has four wheels, can travel 45 miles an hour, and uses a retractable landing gear. The welded steel frame is mounted on two motorcycle wheels with room only for the driver. The puzzle is whether the machine should take motorcycle or automobile license plates. That's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> and then we have the vacuum bonnet that cleans the face. Oh, if you're claustrophobic, that would suck. Not a new type of gas mask is this head covering, but a new type of beauty bonnet designed to give treatments in a vacuum. Ugh, that looks horrible. Made of stout, light wire and covered with a strong old silk, the bonnet has a front window through which the wearer may see. Air is pumped out with a mild electric pump or else a pump that may be open, oh, sorry, operated off any water faucet. The operation of a vacuum on the skin is said to be very beneficial for cleaning out the pores and refreshing the skin. But gee, I wonder why that didn't catch on. And here we have a blade cuff. Blade cuff increases propeller efficiency. Illustrating the latest advance in the design of propellers for high-speed military aircraft is this propeller equipped with the new blade shank cuffs now in production for installation on many types of U.S. Army and Navy planes. Tests have shown that through the use of cuffs, cylinder temperatures of air-cooled planes can be lowered, takeoff thrust increased, and blade shank drag of high-speed installations reduced. I don't know what I'm looking at. Okay, I think we did read this one. We have read some of this. Flying Battlesnake. I think we read some of this stuff too. I can't remember, it was a while ago. I think we read that about boats. Seals with sheepskin. What the heck? It's all about sh seals. Shields. Science and short pants. Create. Hollywood's odd, odd job men create movie miracles. This is the how to build section. This sounds fun. Highlight with a compo flector. What is a, I'm curious, what is a compo flector? Above, this portrait was taken with the aid of a single light and the compo flector, which served to effectively highlight the shadow side of the face. Oh, cool. Well, maybe we should read about the compo flector. I guess it's this thing up here. Made of aluminum coated, stiff, composition board. The reflector unit is easy to replace and cheap to make. Showing here how the gooseneck upright attaches to the sliding arm of the stand. Interesting. Okay. The compo flector can be set quickly at any desired angle for highlighting shadow areas. Using one main light at a 45 degree angle, this reflector will throw just enough diffused light onto the opposite side of the face to eliminate blocking up of this area. The reflector illustrated is simply a sheet of stiff composition board measuring 1 8 by 16 by 22 inches and coated on one side with a good grade of aluminum paint. It is mounted on a flexible gooseneck to allow it to be tilted to any desired angle. The gooseneck is fastened to a telescoping standard so that the reflector may be raised or lowered at will. 
The photograph of the model was made with a single light source placed above and to the left of the subject. A reflector was placed on the right side of the subject to throw soft light into the dark areas, providing detail in the shadows and increasing the modeling effect. Naturally, by placing the reflector closer to the subject, the highlighting could have been emphasized. To build this reflector, you will need the following material. 1 8 by 16 by 22 inch piece of press, press wood, pressed wood, 1 16th by 3 fourths by 8 and 1 quarter inch strip of band iron, a 12 inch long flexible gooseneck, a hexagon nut to fit threaded end of gooseneck, 1 8 inch pipe coupling, two round head 1 8 inch screws, half inch long hexagon nuts to fit, a telescoping floor stand. The reflector should be stiff and light in weight and of a material that will not warp. The writer selected 8 1 8 inch pressed wood, but one can use sheet aluminum or even a sheet of smooth-sided corrugated pasteboard. Assuming that 1 8 inch pressed wood is used, obtain a sheet the size given and round off the sharp corners by sawing off the points and curving the edge with a file. Now give the smooth side of the board a coat of good grade aluminum paint. Use a soft and fairly wide brush and apply the paint quickly and evenly. Brush the board lengthwise so that the brush marks will all be in one direction. If you find that a second coat is desirable, apply a thin coat crosswise. This will give a crisscross pattern of brush marks that will aid in scattering the reflected light rays, thus producing softer and more uniform illumination. If aluminum is used, remove the polished surface with steel wool or a kitchen cleanser and proceed as outlined above. If corrugated pasteboard is used, it would be advisable to give the board a coat of clear varnish or shellac before applying the aluminum paint. This avoids absorption. Then apply the paint as outlined above. The reflecting screen is fastened to one end of a 12 inch flexible gooseneck by means of a support made of strap iron or steel band. The strap is bent into a U with a triangular loop in the center of the strap. See drawing. The two outside bends should be made first. Bend the two ends of the band down at an angle of about 20 degrees, then make the two center bends upwards. This will bring the two ends of the band to a parallel position with a space of about one eighth of an inch between them. Now drill a three eighths inch hole in the bottom of the triangular loop for the threaded end of the gooseneck. Drill two five thir five thirty seconds inch holes through the parallel prongs of the U for the two one eighth inch round head machine screws that fasten the U to the reflecting screen. These holes can be about two inches apart. Now drill two holes through the bottom center of the reflecting screen and fasten the U in position. Thread the top position of the telescoping stand and fasten the gooseneck to this section by means of a 1 8 inch pipe coupling. Fasten the reflecting screen and U to the other end of the gooseneck by means of a hexagon nut and the reflector is complete. If you cannot obtain a flexible gooseneck that is stiff enough to support a pressed wood reflector at any angle, the answer is to use lighter weight material for the reflector. If you have the gooseneck nickel plated, you will find that its stiffness has been greatly increased. The author had this done for the low cost of 25 cents. I'm guessing that's not what it will cost now. Another trick is to insert a 12 inch length of heavy and stiff galvanized wire inside the gooseneck. If desired, you can make use of the back of the reflector and thus have a choice of two reflecting surfaces. Well, that's cool. Photo kinks for camera fans. Photo kinks. This print is tiny and with my dil diluted pupils. I don't think I, it's very hard to read. Look at this. Tabletop tripod. 
you can make your own tabletop tripod. The efficient looking tabletop tripod illustrated above can be assembled at a cost of less, less than a dollar. It features a top that tilts to any angle, widespread legs, good working height, and a counterbalanced body with a low center of gravity which prevents tip overs when the camera is at an odd angle. The body of the tripod consists of a five cent darning egg altered as follows. Des describe a circle around the egg three eighths of an inch from the top and saw off this top to provide a seat for the tilting top. Smooth the sawed edges with a file for a snug fit. A tilt right tilting unit was used, but any such accessory will do if it has a flange for fastening to the body of the tripod similar to the one shown in the photo. Drill three evenly spaced holes in the flange, countersunk on top, and fasten the flange with one eighth by three quarter inch oval round head brass screws. The penciled circles on the darning egg are for the three eighths inch dowels which form the legs. And then you have to continue to page 143. They are spaced approximately one and a half inches from center to center and are kept even by the circular pencil line under them, which is scribed five eighths of an inch above the bottom of the egg. The three eighths inch dowel legs are nine and a half inches long and enter the wood one and a quarter inches. They have a base spread of nine inches. Use a quarter inch drill instead of a wood bit for drilling the hole straight in for about one eighth of an inch. Then angle the bit toward the sharp corner of the opposite side of the top until the depth of one and a quarter inches have been reached at the shallowest part. This will give the correct angle to the legs. Wrap a piece of rubber inner tube around the egg to avoid marring and hold upside down in a vise when drilling the holes as it is comparatively easy to get the right angle when this is done. The 3 8 inch dowel legs are first dressed down with sandpaper to about 5 16 of an inch and later waxed for a finished job. The legs should be fitted snugly into the quarter inch holes in the body. Rubber headed thumbtacks are driven evenly into the bottom of the legs before assembling and turned down on an emery stone to a size slightly larger than the wood legs. The tailpiece, if not substantially solid in the egg, should be glued in or pinned at the lower part, turned or cut down to a size of one quarter by five eighths of an inch to fit the opening of a doorknob. The doorknob is filled to about one inch of the top with lead for a counterbalance. A nickel plated or chromium plated knob with set screw is preferable as it looks better. The set screw holds the knob firmly to the tail piece. And that is how you make a tabletop tripod. And in August of 1940, that was less than a dollar. It's kind of depressing. An auto spring crossbow. You could make an auto spring crossbow. Wow. Model, modern target practice version of a highly efficient medieval weapon. Simply made of easily obtainable materials. This crossbow, crossbow is strong and accurate. Here's a picture of somebody with one of them. The bowstring is drawn back to the trigger by means of a short piece of broom handle fitted with hooks. A crossbow of surprising power and accuracy can be easily and quickly made of a leaf from an old auto spring and other scrap material. It is copied from the medieval crossbows, which were of two types. The more powerful kind required a windlass to draw the, bow, the bowstring back over the trigger mechanism, while the lighter type was fitted with a stirrup in which the bowman placed his foot while he pulled the bowstring back with a hook and a wooden handle. It is on the latter type that the crossbow in this article is modeled. While not as powerful as the windlass type, it is far stronger than the usual bow and more accurate for two reasons. 
the user is under no muscular tension while aiming and the stock is held against the shoulder as is that of a rifle. In making the crossbow, it is best to string the bow first. The bow shown here is a leaf measuring 32 inches on the curve from the spring of an old Dodge car. It is a little less than two inches wide with a little more than an eighth of an inch thick at the middle and tapers slightly toward the ends. Any leaf having about, the, about these dimensions should do. A larger leaf will be too hard to bend. Most auto junkyards will furnish what is needed. The bowstring is a piece of 1 8 inch wire cable. This cable is looped around two machine screws which are put through holes near the ends of the bow. A piece of split brass tubing is forced over each end of the bow to protect the cable from being bent too sharply. When the bow is strung, there should be some tension on the bowstring and the nuts should be well tightened to pre prevent slipping. That part of the crossbow that corresponds to the barrel of a rifle as well as to the stock are made of 2x2 two two scrap lumber. The front end of the barrel is cut on a slant so that when the bow is affixed, the bowstring will clear the top of the barrel. The bow is held in place by a piece of quarter inch threaded rod which is thrust through a hole drilled in the barrel a few inches from its forward end. This rod is put in straight and then bent forward until it forms a U with square corners. Its two ends are then put through two holes in the bow. The stirrup of scrap metal has two corresponding holes. It is slipped over the ends of the threaded rod after the bow is in place and the assemblage is held together by nuts. A small piece of hardwood is screwed to the underside of the barrel and projects slightly beyond its forward end to prevent the bow from slipping off the slant. And two pieces of metal are inlaid in the sides of the barrel to prevent the threaded rod from tearing the wood. Next, take a piece of broomstick about 10 inches long and put two heavy nails through it at the center and three quarters of an inch apart. Bend these nails into hooks. With this, the bowstring is pulled back over the well, which contains the trigger mechanism. The exact location of the well is determined by how far it is possible to pull back the bowstring. With one foot in the stirrup and with the butt braced against the body, Draw the bowstring as far back as possible using two hands on the handle of the hook and exerting full strength. A second person then marks the barrel, indicating how far the bowstring has been pulled back. The well, which is three inches long by five eighths of an inch wide, extends forward from this mark. The well, by the way, has no bottom. That is, it is simply a rectangular hole passing right through the barrel from the top from top to bottom. Revolving freely in the well on a quarter inch iron shaft which pierces the well's side walls at their centers is the post. The post consists of two plates of 1 16th inch brass with a piece of 3 8 inch hardwood between, all three members being riveted together. The plates are, let's see, the plates are one by three inches, but the piece of hardwood is a half inch shorter, thus allowing room for the end of the arrow to fit between the plates and rest with its notch against the bowstring. The post extends a half inch above and below the barrel and is locked in a vertical position when the crossbow is cocked and ready for use. The trigger blocks its lower end and prevents it from revolving on its shaft while the bowstring, which has been drawn back and over it, pulls hard against its upper end. The arrow is then placed in position between the two brass plates. When the trigger is pulled, the post revolves, the bowstring is released, and the arrow flies. The trigger can be made of any scrap metal. The one shown here is made from an iron clothes hook from which superfluous parts were cut with a hacksaw. The two pieces between which the trigger pivots are the end brackets of a brass curtain rod. A bit of spring metal in the well presses the post against the trigger. Two narrow strips of 1 8 inch plywood are glued to the top of the barrel. 
they are parallel and form a groove for the arrow. The stock is jointed to the barrel as indicated. The arrows are of 3 8 inch dowel stick. Care must be exercised in selecting straight dowel sticks. Otherwise, the arrows will not fly true. No set rule governs the length of the arrows. There in the those in the photos are of various lengths, but 22 inches seems to give good results. The end of the arrow is filed with a rat tail file to form a notch that will fit the bowstring. The feathers are attached with a good grade of quick drying celluloid cement of the type used in model airplanes. They should be attached about an inch from the end to allow a sufficient length of bare dowel stick to fit between the brass plates of the post. Feathers all cut and ready may be bought at department and sporting goods stores that carry archery equipment. Should no such store be available, feathers from a feather duster will do. Cut them two and a half inches long, half inch wide at the widest, widest part, tapering to one eighth of an inch at the narrow end. Split the quill with a razor blade. After the feather has been so cut and shaped, hold it firmly between two small pieces of plywood or stiff cardboard. I have to go back to 143. In such a manner that only the split quill shows. To this, apply the cement and press against the arrow, holding it a moment for the cement to dry and harden. Each arrow requires three such feathers, and they should be set at an angle of 120 degrees from one another. The arrow tips are of two types, hunting tips and target tips. The former are of steel, sharply pointed and barbed. The latter are simply brass caps that fit over the end of the arrow. While both are obtainable at stores carrying archery goods, adequate tips are easily made by driving a light nail into the end of the arrow with the grain, forcing a piece of light brass tubing over the arrow and far enough down so that a little of the wood is visible in front. Cutting off the nail's head and bringing the hole to a sharp, symmetrical point with the file. Such a tip will pierce a target consisting of a circular, straw-filled cloth cushion or a target of a heavy cardboard. Interesting. Pretty cool. Here we have our racing boat. And they have the little designs for that. woodworking projects for the homemaker and it looks like some of these were sent in by by people we have a novel thermometer look at that a cardboard calendar thermometer of the type shown is usually discarded as soon as the calendar has expired with a minimum of effort however the thermometer may be converted into a colorful and permanently useful article as illustrated, the segment of cardboard containing the thermometer is cut out and mounted on a jigsawed back piece representing a test your strength booth at the carnival or fair. Enlarge the pattern for the back piece to the required size by means of the squares. Transfer a quarter inch plywood or other thin material and jigsaw to shape. The size of the recessed opening will be governed, of course, by the size of the thermometer to be mounted in it. So you can use the squares to, you know, make it larger, however large you need it to be. This was something that businesses used to do. You don't really see it so much anymore, but they would uh, send you, or you would pick up in their store, uh, a little thermometer, and it would have the business's name on it and maybe their phone number or location. So they're saying you could just take one of these and just take the thermometer out, or it would be in a little calendar that you got from the business. And then we have initial bookends. Dress up your den table or desk with a set of these bookends. Use only maple, figured gum wood, or walnut. Use stock which will dress down to a thickness of one and a half inches for base and block letters. The square diagrams show the relative appearance of letters cut out one inches and one and a half inches in cross section. The one and a half inch thickness will give both types of letters a modern appearance. Letters may be joined. 
single letters should be cut from blocks 5 inches wide and 6 inches high. Mark them carefully and saw them out on a jigsaw. The base is 7 inches long and the vertical piece 7 and a half inches long, both being finished 5 inches wide. Assemble with a 3 8 inch, assemble with 3 8 inch dowels. Wow. You can also make a nautical lamp. The wooden base of this nautical lamp is bound in quarter inch rope. Turn down the base from a glued up block of gum, gum wood or walnut about five and a half inches in diameter and 10 inches high. A bead is turned around the top and bottom of the lamp. The one at the top being three and three quarters inches in diameter and the one at the bottom five inches. A shoulder is formed one inch below the top, which curves upward and in to meet the lower edge of the bead at the top. A bead or slight depression is turned from a point slightly below the shoulder at the top to a point one inch from the bottom against which the rope is secured. Bore holes at the top and bottom of the base to take the ends of the rope as shown in the drawing. After turning the base, leave it on the lathe and coat the depression around the sides with a good grade of glue. Glue one end of the rope in the top hole and wind the rope around the base tightly, taking care to collect any slack and keep the rope taut. Glue the lower end of the rope in the lower hole. Bore a hole from the top of the base to a point near the bottom and another hole at an angle to meet it as shown to take the light cord. Fasten a switch socket in place. Finish the base and rope binding with clear lacquer, or if you prefer, leave the rope natural. If a bridge type lampshade is used, you will need a wire clip attached to the center of the shade bracket so it will slip over the light uh, bulb, bringing the shade to a proper height. If possible, buy a lampshade with a ship motif or anchor design in keeping with the rope round the rope bound base. Wow. These are kind of complicated. <laughs> I'd get about halfway through these and just give up. <laughs> Did you know that tree stumps make ideal garden seats? This is gonna be our last one. Now we'll read the hammock too. Before you remove a cluster of saplings because the trees border too closely on your flower beds, consider the advisability of converting the stumps into a garden seat. This can be done readily by cutting off the trunks at bench height and mounting a suitably shaped board across their tops. Ooh, what a neat idea. In case there are not enough stumps in the cluster to support the seat firmly, Additional legs cut from tree branches can be driven into the ground where needed. Circular shaped seats go well with modern architecture, while at the shaded turn of an informal path, an odd shaped seat fits naturally into the setting. By letting the rearmost sapling of a cluster remain standing, a backrest is provided. Huh. For the sake of comfort as well as appearance, Tree seats should sit set level. Either of two methods, as will be noted in figure two, can be employed for, employed for sawing off a cluster of saplings on a level plane. One employs a pair of crossed chalk lines strung tautly through the cluster and made true with the aid of a line level. The other calls for cutting one stump to height first and then chalk marking the others on a plane with it. Long wood screws, countersunk and sealed with dowel plugs, are used for fastening. That's a neat idea. I've never thought of doing that. That's cool. And then finally, we have a comfortable barrel stave hammock. An excellent hammock can be made from ordinary barrel staves, some rope, and two broom handles, as shown in the drawing. Galvanized nails or staples can be used to secure the rope to the staves. The ends of the rope are fastened to the spreader bars and an additional length of rope is used to fasten the hammock itself. Padding can be made to fit the hammock if desired. 
the staves can be painted a bright color. What a cute little hammock. So that is a look through some of the articles in the little do-it-yourself projects in the Mechanics Illustrated issue from August of 1940. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you got your 10 cents worth out of this guaranteed magazine today. And I hope you have a wonderful day. I'll see you again soon.